Well, hello, Lee. How are you doing? Hi, Namali. I'm fine. How are you? I'm good too. I am happy to be here today. And what we decided, what we have decided that we probably ought to be doing is just to do a little bit of a recap and a kind of a contextualizing call around a series of videos that you and I created for whoever is interested, but I was primarily thinking in terms of my coaching clients um, when I want to introduce certain ideas to them who are not yet familiar. We did a series of calls on the stages of development, values development really more specifically using the theory of spiral dynamics that comes from Claire Graves. We've gone through all of the stages to the best of our ability, um, bringing together different pieces of research, information that's available to anyone, really. So today, Lee, let's perhaps talk about how stages can be used as a tool and also how stages should not be used as a tool. Um, the All of these things that we talk about really are tools, tools for productivity, tools of knowledge. And there is always an ethical and right way of using any tool. Uh, and there is a wrong way of using any tool as well. And it's okay for us to make judgments around what's a, a good tool and what's not a good tool and how can tools be used. So uh, that's what we were thinking of doing today. What would you like to add to that? Well, thanks, Namali. It's a great introduction. And I would say that, um, indeed, as you say, we can use these developmental theories as tools. And we can use tools in beneficial ways, but also in less skillful ways. And you and I, of course, are uh, great proponents of using tools in uh, skillful ways. And if we think about these levels of development or value memes, then we can use these tools to increase understanding and empathy. So to be able to inhabit the perspectives of other people with whom we perhaps disagree or um, who have very different perspectives on reality than we do. And one of the people who does this very skillfully is, of course, uh, our friend Jeff Saltzman of the Daily Evolver, the podcast host. And he uses historical developments, uh, current political situations to showcase how we can take different perspectives and understand much more clearly why certain social and political and historical events occur or have occurred as they do or did and feel empathy towards all of the people involved and to allow space within our awareness for all of those different perspectives to uh, coexist without denigrating their value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Jeff really is a great example. I mean, I think he just has a beautiful knack uh, of seeing different perspectives at play and really speak about them with a very non-judgmental way uh, and to really value each perspective and to even really shine a light on how we need, we absolutely and critically need all of these different perspectives to exist. So, yeah, so I think perhaps one of the things that we can start exploring is really, let's just go to the heart of why the, the aspect of stages in the Ken Wilber model, for example, or stage theories in general, why does it cause uh, some among us to kind of cringe a little bit and just get really nervous around bringing up the topic of stages. So let's maybe start with what's most difficult about this whole conversation. And, um, you know, what the one, maybe you and I can both uh, offer these examples of why this needs to be taken seriously, this question of why the conversation on stages can be tricky and ought to be tricky. One of the first examples that comes up for me is pigeonholing people, boxing people up. I think this is one of the common mistakes that happen and it's, and it's right for people to point that out. Many of us that certainly you, Lee and I uh, know from the integral community have learned about stages through Ken Wilber's work. The truth is that Ken Wilber has done a lot of homework for us. He has actually learned about 
what Lawrence Kohlberg said uh, about, about his model of moral development stages, perhaps, around Eric Erikson, around uh, Robert Keegan, about Aurobindo, Suzanne Kugreuter, Bill Torbett, uh, Terry O'Fallon. I mean, a lot of these people have done a lot of homework and done a lot of research on their own to find out different kinds of stage models. James Fowler on spiritual faith development, Piaget on cognitive levels of development, probably the most popular stage theorist. I mean, I can go on. There's just so many others. Gebser, who has talked about uh, stages of development. So in many ways, a lot of us haven't done that much homework in trying to understand the nuances of each of these different stage models that are measuring or proposing sequences of development in different lines of development or intelligences that we have also talked about, which is another big part of the Ken Wilber integral model. So when we don't go into the nuances of, a diff or of all these different teachers and their teachings, we can all make the mistake of minimizing and uh, just sort of blending it all in and then making statements that are like one size fits all blanket statements around this culture is here and that person is uh, at this stage and and I think we all have to be careful about not falling into that trap of just making blanket statements just because we've learned a little bit about spiral dynamics it doesn't by any means capture the complexity of human reality and social reality and cultures and relationships and trade and just anything you can think about is far more complex than what spiral dynamics can say about it. So this is one of the, the, the main mistakes, I think, is that without doing all of the homework that we ought to be doing, we shouldn't fall into the trap of just sort of making flippant statements using stages of development in pigeonholing people or pigeonholing cultures. Um, I think that's a very valid point. And again, to me, in the analogy of tools, I, I just think of, of a hammer. I mean, a hammer is a, a wonderful tool to um, hammer in some nails, but if you misuse it and, and use it to hammer someone on the head, then it's not the fault of the hammer. So I would say there's Stage theories can be very useful, and indeed, if we use them skillfully, we can increase empathy and understanding, and if we use them less skillfully, we can actually create more division and indeed pigeonhole people or devalue the ideas or feelings of people. And then there's also the theoretical point that you just referred to, and that is that all of these models describe reality but are not reality, of course. They point to something in reality. They point to a particular um, phenomenon in reality, which is the unfolding of complexity through different levels of discernible complexity. And how you divide those levels is somewhat arbitrary. And even the measurements of what constitutes levels is quite arbitrary. And that was something interesting that um, you referred me to Zach Stein, who has a, a very interesting perspective on this. He's um, a former Harvard a uh, teacher, I think, who um, is very well versed in uh, developmental theory and is uh, also Kurt Fisher. Indeed, yeah. he, he's also very knowledgeable about Kurt Fisher. And that was an interesting thing that I learned from Zach Stein is that some of the experiments that have been used to demonstrate stage theories can also be interpreted in more in uh, a skill acquisition framework. And that doesn't discredit stage theories, but it does mean that the wielding of stage theories actually requires a great deal of, of humility. So to know that we're speaking about approximations and to be able to apply it correctly, you have to take into account many variables and not to have a too high level of certitude. So that was also what you were referring to indeed. And I mean, if we look historically, you can also say that these stages they fall apart very quickly if you look at specific examples. So if we look, for instance, at the Roman Empire, and you would have to say, well, was it primarily 
a red empire or a blue empire or a, a more a purple empire. It was all three of those spread out across time and with different people representing those uh, value memes at different times in, in greater and lesser degrees. So the value of these stage theory models, for me at least, is that you can generalize so that you can then speak more skillfully about specific um, aspects of reality. But indeed, we must be very cautious not to take these models too seriously and to be too certain about the meaning and the application. Yeah, absolutely. We want to look at it in terms of how the stage theories, all of these stage theories are only partially true. And so, as you said, to take it lightly in some ways and look at it in general, so that in a way we can then fine tune and be more surgical about what we're actually talking about and how we want to use these tools when when to use it and when to let it go um for example i'm you, you and i are both coaches i'm also right now learning a lot about trauma i'm in a gabo mate course right now it's a year long training so i'm getting trained in kind of looking at trauma and addiction and those kinds of topics when we are in the sort of the helping field for example or when we're trying to kind of be some sort of a mentor or a guide or a friend even to somebody. We really want to just drop all of these models and just meet people as people, as this beautiful complex human that's right in front of us. And we want to speak up if somebody is trying to approach us and pigeonhole us, we want to be able to speak up against that. No, you need to actually just be present to me and my reality as it is right now. So we can be, we, this is exactly what we don't want to be doing is to be just using these models to categorize people. That's not what we're doing. And, and specifically with spiral dynamics, because that's just the one model that we used. Uh, it's really around values. It's sort of like different structures and, and of sets of value that we see I really like what Don Beck used to say, which is that these stages are not about types of people. They're types in people. It's sort of like systems of values that we're attracted to, that we go after. I'm not saying this very accurately. Well, I think you are. You're referring to memes. And basically, you could say that instead of that people have ideas, that some ideas have people. I think that that is the basic idea behind memes and these mm -hmm. structures are also referred to as value memes so it's i i always think of it like um if you look at a mass of people then some people can get swept up in behaviors that they wouldn't normally engage in because of the uh, of, of mass psychology and from my perspective i would say that these value memes are a type of sustained cultural mass psychology but then even more complex but um to which we become recruited um, in a particular way. So an example of that for me would be how some people can go from being um, very convinced uh, creationists to then um, having a breakthrough and then sort of being recruited into the orange, more rational meme. And so moving from the blue to the, to the orange, basically. And I would say that's a way in which we become possessed by first one value meme and then by the next. I don't know if that was what you were referring to. Yeah, it all makes sense. Yeah. I was uh, not in that moment thinking in terms of the meme. So, so thank you for, for adding that. Yeah. So, so there are lots of ways in which we can misuse any tool, uh, including these, I, this sort of very complex, ideas and concepts and teachings around stages. Um, and as you said, that's not the fault of the hammer. Who uses it and how is the problem? These tools are just tools. Let us all remember to use them wisely and carefully. Um, and 
you know, if we're conscious, even playfully, just to understand more about what's going on in the world and what's going on in ourselves, really, to begin there. Um, and let's not, I think another problem we make with uh, any tool, including a stage theory, is that we, I think the integral community is guilty of this also, it's just fetishizing it. You know, this is a word that um, Hansi Feinach used. Uh, I know that's not his real name, Daniel Gortz. Or Gortz, I think. Gortz, yeah. um, and that's true. I think that's how we simplify. We learn a, some, some among us learn a little bit and then we make that the territory uh, instead of using it as a map or evangelizing these theories. So just plainly put, don't do that. I would also say hold open um, and be curious around the fact that all of this could be completely wrong, that you know, evolution and growth means that there are emergent realities that we're just utterly unaware of. So I'm completely comfortable and even like the idea that as I grow and evolve, there'll be an amazing time when none of this makes sense. And that'll be a good thing that I can easily drop uh, my way of comprehending the world, um, that I don't need these tools anymore. And that'll be a wonderful place to be in also. So, but do I want to hurry and disregard all of this before I got, get there? No. And that's the value of having these tools to understand where we're coming from. Yeah, now that's a great point. And I would say that you point to something very interesting, and that is that all of these models are also susceptible to evolution and um, and that they will change over time. And I know that Ken Welber said this himself about his integral model is that it will continue to grow and evolve um, into the future as new data arises and uh, indeed new realities emerge. And actually, a mutual friend of ours, Peter Merry, he's been working on a model of stages that is more cyclical. So where it's not a linear model, which is, of course, very appealing. And that's also one of the criticisms um, that is leveled against stage theories is that they entrench a particular type of linearity into um, a model while reality itself is not that linear if you... Um, look at it uh, holistically. So I think that's a way also in which we can see that many people are offering new perspectives and opening new doors to um, the evolution of these types of models. And as you say, indeed, um, it can be the case that we either outgrow them as individuals or that as a collective, we come up with much more accurate models which incorporate some of the criticisms that are leveled against the current models. Yeah, uh, something that came to my mind that uh, through uh, Barry Johnson's work who teaches polarity management is that with anything, we can bring two approaches to how we examine something. One is what he calls the resume approach. So what we have accomplished, what we know of, we can be proud of that. We can practice humility around that. We can practice compassion around that. But we can also be proud about accomplishments of ourselves, of how we have grown and evolved, of cultures, communities, skill building, competencies, whatever. It's like if you're applying for a job, you bring in the resume approach, which is you want to you want to be really proud of what your accomplishments are and how you have grown and evolved and what you have learned and get gotten better at. Therefore, you are deserving of this job. And then he also says in the other approach to bring to anything is the is the uh, the witness approach, which is if you were called as a witness to a court case, you are asked to offer the whole truth and nothing but the truth, which means you want to be critical, which you want to, which means that you are willing to examine things that are uncomfortable and difficult and detriment and you know things that are painful. So we can bring both of these approaches to how we examine anything. He was talking about this specifically around sort of diversity, inclusivity issues, you know, the use of critical race theory, which has kind of blown out of proportion here in the U.S. How can we be proud of the accomplishments of the U.S.? 
around race issues. It's not all completely bad and terrible. There are many things that have been corrected and improved uh, around race relations in this country. And we can bring the witness approach, which is while we are proud of our accomplishments, we can also take a critical look at things that are yet messy and um, discrimination still exists. So in that way, I think we can bring that approach to development uh, in general and how we look at it, how we talk about it, how we teach it, how we learn it. Yeah, so let, let's talk a little bit about the value of having these tools. Yeah, so I would say one of the benefits of using these models of um, uh, development is that sometimes they can also be very predictive. And for instance, if we look at the writings of Ken Wilber in the 80s, for instance, um, and 90s, then, and also, of course, the spiral dynamics model, it predicted very much the emergence of the green level of development or value mean as a significant cultural force. And that is actually what we're seeing. And the theories also predicted the shadow side of that emergence. And that's what we're currently very much immersed in is that uh, emergence of green and, um, and also push back against the, the shadow aspects of green and also push back against healthy green from um, shadow orange, for instance, and shadow uh, uh, yellow. And by applying these stage theory models, we can see that this is a natural phenomenon and that it's actually all part of an evolutionary process moving towards greater complexity and higher levels of functioning within society and culture and individuals. A way in which the levels are also beneficial in my perspective is that because we have a perspective that each higher level of development is more complex and able to include more and to value more of reality, that also gives us a map that we can use to analyze our own level of functioning, our own center of gravity, so to speak, within those stages, and then to see if I would like to develop personally as an individual across these stages, which activities or which um, reflections or which practices can I engage in to progress through these stages? And for me, and I think for you also, having such a perspective has been helpful to develop very specific um, abilities and to indeed to be able to include more and more of reality and to be more and more in harmony with everything that is. So learning about things like stage systems is that you can relax our emotional attachment to our perspectives in a way. We suffer, at least according to Buddhism, life gets really painful when we grasp and attach, get attached to our view and our way of looking at something. So it just is so helpful to relax that tendency to get stuck in a perspective. And I think when we learn about stages, we can really relax into, explore, become fascinated by the multiple perspectives that are available around any given issue. Uh, whether it's a cultural, a cultural war issue or healthcare issue or relationships issue or whatever, um, the value of stage systems is the multiplicity of how we can take perspectives around that and release the grip. Um, notice where we are sort of obsessively even perhaps latched on to one perspective as a preference and then vitriolic or really pathologizing other views. And so I think it's interesting to, to, to really remember that to deny stage theories or to say that that's bad is also a hierarchical statement. I think the whole, the, the danger and what is disliked about these stage theories is often the, the issue of hierarchies, that there is 
one that is better, more powerful than the other. And, and that always causes, can cause a lot of discrimination and danger through if you get stuck in that. And I think it's right to point that out because that has happened in history, how Nazis have thought that a certain race was um, important, significant, valuable than another race. Pretty much all other races were denigrated and destroyed. Uh, if they could, they would have done much more harm if the war didn't come to an end. So that's the way in which we can be careful around the use of these tools, because yes, there is proof that in history, um, this idea of improvement or better can be used in very negative ways. Eugenics. There is a right um, diligence around being careful around these hierarchies. However, if you don't know about stage theories, I think you run into the problem of resisting them or denying its truth or saying that it's bad. And that, and then you fail to see that that in itself is a hierarchical statement. You are claiming that your perspective, that there are no stages or that all stage theories are bullshit is also a hierarchical statement. So I think that's another value of stage theories and learning about them is that we can actually situate our perspectives where they're coming from and then see more more clearly and compassionately how we make perspectives absolutely and i would also say that another benefit of using uh, stage th uh, models or theories of development is that while working with clients for instance if we're speaking about somebody who has poor impulse control, then it's shorthand to be able to say, okay, impulse control, lack of impulse control, impulsivity is very red. And then we can immediately say, okay, what would be the next level of development that would be blue? And what would be the main value of blue? Or one of the main values of blue would be discipline, for instance, and routines, things like that. And if you're speaking about a, a good way to develop better impulse control than, for instance, developing routines or um, creating greater levels of discipline is uh, a good way to do that. So in that way, when helping people, we can also use these models to identify the most logical step in a very quick and succinct way. I think another thing that I would just like to add to that real briefly in, in, in the conversation of how we use these tools is is to not get hung up on just using these relative sort of teachings or stages specifically by itself, that like with using integral philosophy, for example, we can use them in tow with lines of development, for example. So we can fine tune how what, what we're trying to say by not just making statements through just the stages, but states, uh, states and uh, stages, for example, state stage differentiations um, and stages and lines of development. Also around individual whole lawns and social whole lawns. So when we are talking about cultural development, can we, can we apply these stage theories to cultural development? Most likely not in the sense of the sequential ideas because social whole lawns don't evolve in, in a sequence. Uh, individual holons do. Well, there's so much to say and, and we don't have to go overboard, I think. But I guess one other thing that comes to my mind right now is around shadow work. And, you know, that's another idea that is really helpful around, uh, around having something like a stage developmental theory is you were talking earlier about how Wilbur and others sort of predicted the green stage, the postmodernist stage coming on in a very powerful way. And now we can really see a lot of culture wars and everything going on around more and more increased amounts of postmodern thought being around in this world, especially in Western societies. So in that way, we can predict the future to some degree, you know, again, hold it all lightly, 
don't evangelize any of this. It, this is not a religion. <laughs> um, but when we're doing shadow work, which is so important in as an integral life practice, we have a, a way of looking back and just seeing kind of the spectrums or the fulcrums where certain aspects of our personality split off uh, and kind of got stuck in some sort of a pathological state and how we can really look back and, and just really notice our own personal journey through life and bring a much more compassionate way of seeing where we might have gotten stuck and how we can attend to that, how we can see what's missing or what, you know, where, just as an example, a lot of people might have hangups around how much money they've made or how successful they may seem in this world or not. Well, you can see that that is generally a, a tendency or a stuckness around the orange stage. And when we don't acknowledge some of our struggles in certain stages, it can turn to shadow. It can turn to a stuckness in our way of taking perspectives about ourselves, not even about other people. Absolutely. And I, I like the example that you give. And I would say that when you're doing shadow work, you can use the stages to identify two directions to move in at least. So for instance, I, I liked the example because you said, well, if you're um, experiencing frustration around the level of success you experience in society, uh, so the a frustration within orange, then you could perhaps, you can look back at blue and say, blue is very good, of course, at order and of asserting that everyone has their specific place in society and that is fine as it is. So that's a way in which you can say, okay, this is apparently where I am in life and I uh, should accept it from um, a perspective of, uh, of blue. And you can also move in the direction from orange to green and say that the valuing of your worth societally is basically a hierarchical movement. And you can, at green, you can deconstruct that hierarchy and say, well, is it really the case that my value is dependent on my um, social rank? And you can then easily see, well, not necessarily. And then um, you can also move out of that frustration and, for instance, compare yourself to the uh, many people in the world who are uh, significantly worse off than you are and see that there's also um, a level of self-deception at play in that assessment of um, not being successful, for instance. So those are ways in which the stages can also help to structure our approaches to shadow work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess one other thing that comes to my mind is um, just the sort of the controversy around do stages really exist in, you know, is it some sort of a kind of a white man's development? Um, I think just real simply, I think a lot of people who who use developmental theories, who have studied developmental theories will probably agree um, that it's not just a sort of a white man's eugenics type of development. Um, there are aspects of it in the, in the stage theories, but also there are other cultures uh, throughout the world, like the Buddha was talking about stages of development in certain sense of how to ethically behave in the world or in certain meditate developing meditative states. Sri Aurobindo the, was an Sri Indian Aurobindo, yeah. I mean, there's uh, in Sufism and Hinduism, and there's just so many different ways that um, we can go thousands of years back to not the modern stages that we live in, but to these religious traditions, spiritual traditions, old uh, Greek philosophies, and where the stages are things that people have studied. And to throw it all out because of a sort of an emotional discomfort that one might feel around the existence of uh, stages is a loss, I think. It's a loss for our learning and our growth in this world. So ultimately, I think, you know, we did this series of calls on stages and today we're just simply saying there's value to that. 
and be careful. We all want to practice diligence and practice uh, that both the resume approach as well as the critical, uh, the witness approach with any of these tools. Stages are not the uh, be all end all of everything. Uh, it is a controversial uh, idea, uh, but it has value. So can we be critical about these ideas as well as use them wisely and celebrate the learning? Just to sort of end with that idea of, you know, use them wisely with care. Yeah. Well said, Namali. Thanks everyone for watching and uh, thanks, Namali. Thank you, Lee.